Shaitan Rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Welcome to this brand new show on Ahlul Bayt TV, The Struggle Within. Um, a look at various dimensions of the inner being, of the individual, of our idea, or of the idea of what is our purpose, our purpose to look within, to better ourselves following the hadith of the Prophet where he was returning from battle and his companions were congratulating one another on having embarked on jihad and the prophet said that you are now to embark on the greater jihad the struggle the struggle within i'm delighted to be joined once again by global assalamu alaikum thank you once again for taking the time out thank you um we are indebted to to your your efforts and your knowledge of thank course you for the invitation um and last week of course we discussed various elements of this introductory elements looking at faculties of the human being the various different elements looking at the idea of examples tangible examples day-to-day examples from depression and how we can potentially be bringing these elements upon ourselves by not having embarked on this course of self-reflection of personal development of akhlaq the, the, the differences between akhlaq as a characteristic and adab as actions we touched on various different things um, this week however I want to try and provide the viewers with a kind of framework something that they can use uh, tangibly as uh, a tool that if I want to start this or I, you know, I can use this as something to go step by step this is what I want to look at um, and I'm glad once again that you could join us to be able to do this um, to go straight in how, how does this again we, we discussed the idea of battle so how does this battle begin or this self reflection or this um, personal development begin where do we start Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim I begin in, in the name of Allah the most merciful, the most compassionate. All praises to Allah, the creator of the universes and the sustainer, the provider of believers and non-believers. And may his choicest blessings be on the seal of his prophets, the last of his messengers and his holy progeny. And we are grateful to the holy prophet, peace upon him, for having given us the answers to the question you pose. Because as we discussed last time in his famous hadith, that I have been sent for the purpose of perfecting human character. We find a framework in the teachings of Akhlaq to be able to address some of the uh, challenges that this greater jihad uh, presents to us. But one of the points about how we embark upon the jihad al-Akbar, the greater jihad, which is the, the, the inner purification, the struggle to, to purify ourselves, when we think about that struggle, the struggle is primarily against our heedlessness, our mindlessness, so that we may be striving towards mindfulness of being conscious of the presence of Allah in all that we do. So really it's a process of striving rather than necessarily battling against ourselves. And the distinction is about acceptance. If we accept the different aspects of ourselves as they are, then we can create the space of being trying to eat, of trying to improve them. But if we deny that these are the weaknesses we have, we don't have a chance of being able to improve them. So that process of striving is grounded upon a very realistic self-assessment of where we are. And everybody has embarked upon this process, whether they're conscious of it or not. By virtue of being born and growing up, you've embarked upon the process. We're all on that, on that road. But the question is, how do we progress faster and more clearly to the objective and the destination that we would really like to get to, rather than getting lost along the way? We used as our map for this uh, journey the Dua'i Makarim al-Akhlaq from Imam Zain Abdin al-Islam, the, 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 the fourth holy Imam in the Shia tradition, and we find in this supplication, in this psalm, a set of teachings of what the terrain looks like and how we can really move purposefully and quickly along this journey. And it's got to be quick because human life is short 
and the journey is long. But the great news, the really good news, is that the grace of Allah SWT enables us to move quickly by His means. And when we slow down, and when we fall into pitfalls caused by shaitan and caused by our own heedlessness, He is there to lift us up. He is our companion at every step along the way. And so the framework, as you put it, that we get from the Makanim al is to focus on our faith. Hence the first verses, وَبَلِّقْ imani أَكْمَلَ الْإِيمَانِ But in, as the Holy Prophet taught in his, one of his famous hadiths on the subject, the way to, to improve our iman, our faith, is to develop our akhlaq, our, our character, and the, the psychology that underpins our character. And through that, as he put it, we can then complete our iman. So how do we do that? Well, we discuss the process of self-analysis, of really looking at ourselves in various different aspects of ourselves. We may, as the sixth Imam taught, Imam Jam Sadiq al Islam, at the end of each day just reflect upon our actions for that day. <clears throat> when we reflect and we find problems, how do we address those problems? And one of the points we discussed last time was that we tread lightly along this path so that when we look within and we find problems, we are compassionate with ourselves. That doesn't mean that we continue doing bad things. What it means is that we help ourselves find a smooth path out of the darkness and back onto the main road upon the Sirat al-Mustaqim, the straight path of the Ahl Bayt When we look at other aspects of this framework, in particular, the mental aspect of this, and how it links to the emotional aspect of this journey. One of the key aspects of this framework that we have is thankfulness. So that we may be thankful even when we're at the bottom of that well of despair. We may be thankful of our ability to be aware of the well. And that thankfulness for just the faculty of being aware create space within ourselves to be able to build and develop our personal character and the behaviors that we manifest to the people around us. When we look at Dua Makarim al Akhlaq, we see this in uh, verse 15. He laka wa la tufsid ibadati bil ujb. He says, make me worship you, help me to worship you. So that the worship doesn't become a source of arrogance, but actually it becomes a manifestation of His grace, that He helped us to be able to worship. And then the second aspect, and corrupt my worship not, do not corrupt my worship with self-admiration, with ujb. And this is the danger, that as we progress, we may fall into the ditch of arrogance, so that as one climbs up the mountain of self-development, we shouldn't fall into the crevasse of arrogance about the progress we have made. This is one of the classic tricks of shaitan. So one of the ways in which we can protect ourselves, um, when we go on a journey, we often take vaccinations, we have inoculation. Well, in the process of personal development, that journey of akhlaq, the vaccine that the Ahmed and Muslim have given us is through being very clear that every step forward is a grace. So thankfulness, shuk, gratitude, that attitude of gratitude that we have is our inoculation. And the Quran is very clear about this. Surah so Baqarah, the second surah, verse 152 is, 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 is very strong in the statement that it gives, which is why I'd like to look at it word by word. It says, فَذْكُرُنِي So remember me from the the, the word dhikr, or remembrance. فَذْكُرُنِي Remember me. أَذْكُرُكُمْ And I'll remember you. So it shows immediately the idea of relationship with Allah SWT. <clears throat> and this is a critical aspect of Islamic personal development. When we look at the akhlaq teachings, we find three-dimensional relationships. Relationship to ourself, and we discuss the compassion and the, and the accountability to ourselves. The idea of 
velam to nafsi, that, that tyranny upon ourselves. Through this verse, we see the relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, relating to Him. Fadkuruni adkurukum. You remember me, I will remember you. So then we have that relationship with Allah on an ongoing basis. And through those two relationships with ourselves and with Allah, we then can have the third relationship with other people, grounded in the wholesomeness of our connection to divinity. And the verse continues. <clears throat> Washkuruli and be grateful to me. Wala takfuruni and do not be ungrateful. But what is important here is that the way in which the verse says do not be ungrateful, the root here is to disbelieve, to cover kafara. So the ayah is 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 combining the principle of ingratitude with the principles of disbelief. Such is the importance of having a mindfulness of thankfulness. This is why the idea of taqwa being akin to mindfulness is critical because if we are not mindful of the grace of Allah we lose that connection with Him. So in terms of the inoculation, the vaccine for this journey, the thankfulness is very important because progress happens very fast. So too does degeneration. And if we're thankful for the process, for the steps that we take, we are less likely to fall down. And if we fall down, we don't need to despair because there is always that rope in the well that rope of connecting back to Allah and seeking His help to lift us out of it. So, <coughs> to, to, to summarize, or to provide viewers again with something um, that they can really uh, hold on to, like, like, like this rope, um, the idea that we begin with the contemplation, with the self-analysis, looking within. And one of the things that we need to look at when we look within, like the verse said, is to remember God. So part of this journey, the beginning of this journey, or part of the beginning of this journey it, within that self-analysis is looking or remembering God. Um, in, that, in that vein, what are we looking at or what are we trying to remember Him for? Is it the, the graces He has given us? Is it His power, His might? his authority or the fact that everything we have is from him again this brings in the thankfulness mm. what, what I'm trying to do is if someone asks you what should I um, when I'm taking uh, on this process of looking within what am I thinking about okay. we've got to begin with trying to find where we are on the map because it's only when we know where we are that we can rationally plot a course of where we want to get to. So, the, and, sorry, this could this could be uh, negative traits that we have. It's so, for example, everything. It's, and, it's, uh, anything. It's the whole package of who we are. Now, because that's so vast, we can get lost in that and then turn back to whatever we were doing before. So, we need to have it bite-sized, very specific. So, for instance, if we think about our relationships to people. So we can think about all the relationships we have with different people. How, what's good about them, what's bad about them, what am I doing to support, what am I doing to damage. If we think about our positive uh, characteristics, what am I good at? How do I want to become better at that and actually use it, use that skill, whatever it might be, in the service that inspires me. Um, we may want to think about our work, for example. You know, what am I doing it in my work? How am I doing it? And by the way, these, these tools of self-analysis and personal development are used extensively in business because they're very powerful. They can be very powerful for business purposes. This is why many companies spend a huge amount of resources on the personal development of their staff. Um, because it's powerful, it's worth investing in. But not just commercially, but also spiritually. So, in terms of what do we think about, let's do that exercise of finding what our 
strengths and weaknesses are, and then identify specific tasks for each week and each month to work on. And in that process, really try and strive. That's where the jihad will really come in. Strive to improve that one aspect of ourselves, but to do it with compassion and to do it with gratitude so that as we see progress, we can be thankful to Allah. I think we'll, we'll, we'll get on to that, but with the, when we look at, for example, will the, and determination, how important that is on this journey, the idea that we can start and we can have a good start, but we need to be determined for, you know, when things don't go so well, when we go through those peaks and troughs and, you know, various things come within life. You could have, for example, a new job, you're too busy now, or it could be anything. A child comes into your life or whatever it is. Um, suddenly you need your, your will and how determined are you to embark on this struggle within? Because it's very easy to, to just carry on, and, you know. 2014 turns into 2015 and so on but the idea to have that determination to carry on but before we do that again I just want to close this chapter if you like on what it is that we're trying to when when we look within what are we trying to look for um, so like we said remembering God so that could be for example his greatness or the graces that he has given us like you said thankfulness and then again looking within and looking at, at for example um, on this journey, um, for example, my behavior with other people is not necessarily an other thing, but deep down it's good. I have a good nature with other people, but for example, my enjoyment of worship, I'll do the bare minimum. That's where I'm at. But just an, an element of looking within and saying this is what I'm good at. And this is, this is where I need work at. Well, this is what I'm good at. I need to be thankful for that, number one. And pray to get better, ultimately. Um, are there anything else? What about sins? Is, is this part of the self-reflection? Maybe looking within and saying, you know what, hold on. Um, I have a backbiting issue. Um, so maybe not necessarily Tawbah. It's not necessarily that. But just accepting that, listen, this is, this is a problem I have. Hmm. Analyzing our sins can be incredibly powerful. Um, this, is, this is perhaps why, um, as we discussed last week, um, in Nafsubalaga, Imam Ali alayhi salam says that <clears throat> a sin that results in Tawbah and, 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 and the real Tawbah, that the self-reflection that goes with it, is better than a good deed that results in Ujb, in self-admiration. Because we can learn a lot from the sins we commit in terms of why we're doing that. So, for example, um, with, uh, with envy or, or, or um, any of the other social aspects. When we look within, it asks the question, well, what aspects of self-esteem do I lack that I am envious of that other person? Or am I insecure? Um, what is it about the deficiency in my own sense of self that results in my emotional behavior of envy? or backbiting, or why am I trying to do that person down? Am I trying to raise myself above him because I somehow feel inferior to him? Is that why I'm backbiting about him? Because there's always a reason underlying it. Why do I enjoy it? What is it that I get? What does it provide a healing for that gnawing sense of insecurity, of that gnawing sense of not being good enough? that if I bring somebody else down by backbiting about them, it makes me feel, oh, I'm not so bad. I'm better than them, at least. Those questions are very powerful in liberating us from that root issue. It's no good saying, oh, I shouldn't do backbiting. Well, okay. But then tomorrow we might do it again. If we don't address the root cause of why we do that sin, it'll keep coming back as a psychological response to the underlying disease. Note the disease as being dis-ease, where we are not at ease with ourselves and the world around us, resulting in psychological disease, of which backbiting and envy is one example. So when we really analyze and go deep within ourselves, asking simple questions, it's like looking in the mirror. So we may catch ourselves, we may notice ourselves backbiting. 
And that's an opportunity to really investigate. Why did I do that? What prompted me to do that? What is underlying that in my subconscious that results in that behavior pattern? That is the jihad. That is the striving. And it's hard and it's painful. We're going to look at various different ailments uh, or diseases, as you, you put it, within this series. Um, I think one of the ones that are um, that is vital to this is this self-admiration, this ego, or this sense of I, or this idea that you know you're important, and when that is challenged, you then put up barriers. Whether it's, for example, you know, being rude, or for example, talking bad about people or trying to put people down. But ultimately, it's this self-admiration. How much of that, in your experience of personal development, in various spheres, uh, is that an issue? H how often is that one of the largest stumbling blocks? Before we go on to determination to, to embark on this or to stay on this path. Well, it is critical. Um, this is why, um, you know, we discussed the, the pitfalls along the journey and, and, and why thankfulness is, is a safety harness as we climb up this mountain. Because Shaitan uses it, that as we progress, the progress itself can become a source of our downfall. This is why in the Makarim al-Akhlaq, Imam Zan Abdi al-Islam says, وَلَا تَرْفَعْنِي فِي النَّاسِ الدَّرَجَةِ Do not elevate me one degree with the people, illa hatatani in the nafsi mithlaha, without lowering within myself that same extent. Now, this lowering is not about self humiliation, it's about humility. There's a big difference. And the difference is the remembrance of Allah, as in the verse that we looked at, athkuruni wa athkurukum. It's by remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the grace that He has given us that we're able to lower ourselves so that we can say, okay, the people may have elevated me in this way, but I know that that good thing for which I am regarded positively is from Allah. Because He helped me develop that good work or that good trait or whatever it might be. So that thankfulness really is at the root of breaking down the arrogance and the conceit. But there's another aspect of it, which is insecurity. Quite often you find that people who present arrogance and conceit really have a problem with their ego not being um, uh, uh, sound. And what I mean by sound is that quite often an insecure ego, an insecure sense of self, creates the need to, to amplify it like a blowfish. You know, really puffs itself up when it is frightened, when it feels under attack. Excuse me. So when we find ourselves blowing up our ego, we need to ask ourselves, well, well, why am I doing this? Why do I feel the need to present myself as being bigger and better than I actually am? What is it that I'm afraid of? And that's a really difficult question, painful question, because quite often the answer lies in how I am worried about being insignificant or worried that people will not value me or want to be with me. We might deep down be afraid of loneliness. So that if people really know how wretched I am, nobody will want to be with me. Now there are various such questions and issues that can lie at the root of what may manifest as arrogance or conceit. But actually deep down, there are many other things going on. And this is where we keep coming back to the dhikr that relationship to Allah Taala, so that when we are feeling weak and alone, we know that we always have the friend with us, always there, thereby negating the need to big ourselves up so that people like us and be with us, which often has the opposite effect, it repels people away. That process of understanding why we do what we do, that is a jihad. And that is one of the aspects, it seems, of what um, Surah Rum is talking about, Surah 30, verse 8, that, 
that's reflecting upon themselves. Because through that, we may be able to realize that the progress we have made, for instance, the wealth we may have, is but a grace from him. It's like that beggar on the street becoming arrogant for having got a coin in his cup. Well, he begged, and the generous one who was passing gave a coin. But the fact that the person has a coin is not a source of arrogance. And this is why we keep remembering that thankfulness, that we asked for help from Allah and we were granted it. And we can have confidence that he will help us, that we may be at the bottom of a particular well right now, but daylight is coming. And this is where, when we look at it in a wider soteriological sense, in terms of you know, the salvation of the world, um, you know, we have at the end of Dua Ahad, uh, that was taught by the Sixth Imam al Islam as our Dua of pledge, uh, of, of covenant with the Imam of our time. The last verse, which is a Quranic verse, it says, In Nahum, Yaron Nahu Ba'idan that they see it as far away, the salvation. وَنَرَاهُ kariban, But we see it as close. And that process of salvation is available to us at all times, even at the bottom of the well. Now, one of the things that this raises is the role of the Imam of your time in your journey. Because the difference between an ordinary guide and an Imam is that with a guide, you ask for directions, and they tell you this is where you go, and you carry on. But with an imam, he takes your hand and delivers you to the destination. This is why we seek the spiritual connection with the imam of our time, to help us. Unfortunately, some Muslims don't understand that, and they try and kill us in the name of shirk, of, of, of ascribing partners to Allah, astaghfirullah, or bid'ah, of, or innovation. But this is not true. Because the reason why we call for help from the saints is the Holy Quran encourages Surah Baqarah in the Ayat of Kursi, مَنْ ذَلَّذِي يَشْفَهُ إِنْدَهُ إِلَّا بِيَذْنِي Who is there who can intercede with him other than through his own permission? So Allah SWT, in His grace, through His Rahmah, has given us Ta'ima alayhi salam as guides to help us along the way. Let us not go astray when the guide is available. And again, connecting with the Imam of our time can help save us from falling into the crevasse of arrogance, of, of various other types of problems. Um, of destroying all the important relationships that we see, for example, with domestic violence. It's a really serious problem in many parts of the community. Um, and one of the roots of that domestic violence is people don't seem to appreciate the wider spiritual significance of what they're doing and the answerability. Not because they're not believers, but because in that moment, when that madness grips them, they have gone off the path and they're on their own. And shaitan has taken control of their state. And this is why the journey of akhlaq is important, because it strengthens our ability to remain in control when we may have countervailing desires to lash out and to attack other people. When the response from the point of view of akhlaq should be one of compassion. So I think you touched on various issues that we're each going to have shows on the idea. We're going to have a show on the ego, on specifically a full show just on introspection. Um, you know, just in detail, what are the various elements that we need to look at? Um, you know, the idea again of the ego, looking at it in depth, looking at how destructive it can be and how it can actually be a source for uh, for good, of course. Um, and then the ideas that we touched on, um, the fact that sometimes we can do actions on the basis because of our own insecurities to try and look or to present ourselves to be better than we actually are. Is that shirk? 
So various different elements, we're going to have various different shows all touching on these various things. But again, we just want to look at the introduction, the introductory steps. So looking here, once we've decided or we've looked within, it seems the next step is to, to have a will, to, to, to say that, okay, I'm now going to look, or having looked at, I'm now going to act on this. Even if it's through intention, even even if it's through a mindset change, or behaving differently, um, but the idea then to have that will to start, and then the determination to continue. You know, one of the most important parts in this whole thing, and again, we'll have another show on this, is willpower. You know, the strength to. For example, I have a friend who has been through a process. In one year, he has lost nearly half his weight but that ultimately is willpower it's it's the idea that you've got temptation temptations around you but no I, this is my will to be or to reach my aim or my goal is stronger than the temptation to to give in to whatever desires are so how important is this strength in this personal development or this process of personal development or akhlaq well Again, we come back to our three-dimensional model of, 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 of faith, of iman, of niya, and amal, of action. Um, beginning with the faith aspect, one of the simplest and most powerful tools available to us is to recognize that willpower, that power aspect of will, we need to recognize la hawla wa la quwata illa billah, that there is no strength or power except through Allah. Therefore, when we feel weak and we feel empty, when we feel our tank is empty, that I just cannot do this, or I cannot do this anymore, we need to recognize that it is not about me, that I have access to an infinite source of power that I can tap into. And that shifts our relationship with the striving, with the jihad, with the challenge of the personal development. And then with that recognition of that will and that power that it, that it comes from, we can then switch to the mental dimension of our niya, of our intention, and apply it to every action and look to transform it to so something simple. Like as we enter our workplace, if we enter it and start our work with Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim in the name of Allah, um, that work that we do can transform from being mundane to being sublime. It actually, we, we can be anything. We can be street cleaners, we can be doctors, we can be lawyers, we can be architects. It doesn't matter. That process of earning an honest livelihood becomes our dhikr. That verse that we looked at um, from Surah Baqarah, Adhkuruni, but that dhikr, how do you do that dhikr? It is not just about sitting on the prayer mat. Our work becomes our dhikr. When we go to the gym, if we begin, if we turn the treadmill on with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, our exercise becomes a dhikr. Why? Because we want to strengthen our limbs in the service of the ultimate purpose for our existence. Hence, as we discussed last time in Dua Kumal, um, Imam Ali al-Islam has the very clear verse قَوِّيَ لَا خِدْمَتِكَ جَوَارِهِ Strengthen my limbs for your purpose through your power قَوِّيَ لَا خِدْمَتِكَ for it serving you جَوَارِهِ my faculties, my, my, my limbs um, so that niya actually becomes transformative but it begins with specific things I am about to do this how do I change my experience of it? And even relaxing. So actually, you know, relaxing, watching that football match can become adhkuruni, can become dhikr. If we, if we devote that time to rejuvenating ourselves in a legitimate way. But we need to be very careful that niya actually protects us from other things such as asraf. Asraf in terms of wastage, culpable wastage. 
We often tell our children, small children, to finish the food on their plate and say, don't do asraf. Well, that's asraf of food, which is very important. But there are many kinds of asraf, particularly asraf of talent, asraf of opportunities. So that that zalam to nafsi, that, that, that tyranny upon ourselves, can be about wasting our ability and our talent and our opportunities. So that process of niya, of, of intention, of motivation, of will, becomes critical in all that we do along the whole journey. But we split that whole journey into this activity now, that activity now. We keep moment by moment. And as we find our attention wavering, we don't scold ourselves harshly and do more tyranny upon ourselves. We compassionately escort our attention back. And that compassion, that softness with which we deal with ourselves in our mind, the way we control our mind to gently bring it back to the near, allows us to be gentle with other people as well. But if we harshly scold ourselves, oh, again, you've forgotten that. That's how we'll speak to other people as well. Is, is that very important for us to, to understand from the outset that will and the resolution and determination to embark on this greater struggle, greater striving, it's not like a flick of a switch. There will be times where, you know, it comes easy and there will be times where it's not so. And, you know, we have to accept that and work with that almost. Or the idea that, you know, resolve is something that ultimately runs out, but then needs to be um, rejuvenated, shall we say. There are cycles in our lives. Our whole existence has cycles. We have cycles of the day, cycles of the week, cycles of the month, cycles of the year. And in that we learn the constant change within ourselves and externally as well. So we need to embrace change and embrace the reality of where we are now, not hang on to what we had yesterday or what we want tomorrow, but appreciate the grace of what we have now in this minute. That creates the space to utilize the minutes that we have now to connect with Allah Taala, And that could be through the work that we're doing. It could be through the exercise that we're doing. It could be through the conversation with a loved one. It could be through any aspect of our existence. But we are multifaceted beings. And the process of akhlaq guides us into thinking in a multidimensional way so that we may be in connection with our spiritual, mental, emotional and physical aspects of our being irrespective of the activity we may be engaged in. So that the dhikr, that verse that we looked at, azkurani wa azkurukum, it doesn't qualify it by saying, remember me on the prayer mat, or remember me you know, when you're doing this particular worship. It's about a state of being. It's about how you are being a human being such that the dhikr permeates all our activities. And that's not just for the great spiritual masters. How did they become great spiritual masters? It's for everyone, in everything that we do. As the Prophet said, this is why he was sent, it's for everyone. That's ultimately very it's an key open to invitation. this. We don't have a caste system where some people are born into spiritual greatness. We have a platform of equality. And that justice of Allah creates an opportunity for each of us to be able to attain proximity to Allah. And ultimately that is the process that akhlaq is for. So that we may be able to achieve that which we ask for in kunut in our salah. Rabbada'atina fid dunya hasana. Allah give me goodness in this world so that we may be happy and fulfilled in this world. وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ hasana, And that we may have bounty and proximity to Allah in the hereafter. 
I'm, I'm conscious of time, uh, which is why um, one thing I really want to touch on is any recommendations you have on practical ways of um, self-examination. I mean, do we? Is it about keeping a, a diary? Um, is that for everyone? Is it about five minutes before you go to sleep? Is it in the morning? Is it about, for example, when you wake up in the morning and you make a stipulation that, okay, I will not backbite today. And you say that to yourself and you actually look in the mirror and you say that. Is that effective? Uh, actually saying that this is my intention for the day, that I'm not going to do this today. Um, do you write that down, for example, uh, when you come back? I mean, what, what, what have you found to be effective? Um, physically uh, writing things down or mentally making notes? What, what, what kind of thing? Uh, is it a weekly thing? Do you look at the end of the week and say, you know, I've had a good week or this was a good week or I, I, I had a mistake here and, okay, I'm finding that I need something to boost my... Um, interest in this subject or you know for example things i've had i've gone through a difficult week at work uh, next week we, we might spend more time considering or discussing these things with a partner spouse wife etc um what how, how do you play it <clears throat> if we look at what the islamic teachings say about how we should play it um we see a number of different aspects we see an invitation to mindfulness on a daily basis, on an intraday basis, with salah. We've got structures in our day. So that process of washing our face, our hands, our body for wudu, when we go to pray, that process of purification, actually when we, when we, when we wash our face, we can reflect upon, the, if we look at some of the, the inner aspects of wudu, for instance, there's a lot about Purifying our thoughts, purifying what we see, purifying how we speak as we wipe our face, as we wash our hands, and we, we think about what actions we've committed since the last time we did withal. So that we are accountable and reflecting regularly. And with our feet, where we've gone, where we've not gone, where we should have gone, and where we've gone, where we should not have gone. All those aspects, there's a constant rejuvenation of our mindfulness. Then there are many ways. The Islamic teachings provide so many different techniques. There's wudu, there's salah. There is just reflecting. And it changes for different people at different times of their life. I don't think there is a silver bullet for all of this. This is, to use your analogy of a battle, where you need an array of tools. Because you're dealing with your own mind. You're striving for your own purification. So you've got to be sensitive to where you are now. There may be times and there may be certain aspects for which writing things down may help. But there may be other things where it's totally inappropriate, it's so personal, that you would not ever dream of writing it down. And you may want to reflect upon it and invite yourself to reflect upon it in different ways. But the key to all the different approaches has to be compassion. So that we don't dig further deeper into the well by compounding our sin with tyranny upon ourselves. Guilt doesn't help anyone. Dauba and repentance is what helps. That is what lifts us out of the well. Forgiving ourselves and ultimately seeking forgiveness from Allah to forgive us for the sins and to raise us. And then we can be thankful for having been lifted out of that particular well. And we continue and we fall into the next challenge. And that cycle continues. We've got to remain cognizant that as we change, our approaches to dealing with ourselves needs to change. So we've got to get to know ourselves. It is remarkable how few people really know themselves. And this is why the Quran encourages us to do that, to get to know ourselves. So that we know what tool will work with what aspect of our attributes, be they positive or negative. I said the, the, the final thing that I want to touch on before we end the show is ultimately Tawba. It's, it's, uh, you could argue that this kind of summarizes this whole journey, the idea of Tawba is that you return back to your Lord. 
uh, after maybe, for example, certain mistakes, or you've gone through a period of of your life of heedlessness, and you recognize that, you know, growing up, for example, you went through a period where, you know, other things took priority. Um, and like you said, compassionately, it's okay to a certain extent, but now it's, you want to make that return. How is the best way of doing Tawbah in your experience? Is it, again, using the du'as that we have, number one? Mm. Um, is it creating your own du'as with your own vices, for example, or your own intentions or your own aspirations that I want to make my return to be a certain type of return back to you? Um, what, what is your take on Tawbah? I, I, I think there are three aspects to what you're saying. Um, the first is... This idea of it's okay. It's not okay. It is never okay to sin against Allah and to sin against ourselves. The process of being compassionate and seeking forgiveness is never about saying it's okay. It was not okay what I did to myself that resulted in this problem that I had. It was not okay that I defied the the teachings of Islam and the command of Allah in committing those sins. It was not okay. It is never okay. That's not what this is about. This is about accepting that this is what happened and moving on in a way that heals the wound created by the sin. So this is about moving beyond rather than staying stuck in that situation. So let us completely negate any idea of it's okay. And forgiving somebody else and forgiving ourselves is actually based upon the same thing. You've got to acknowledge what happened, really what happened, and the consequences of what happened. That doesn't mean it's okay, but you can forgive what happened to create a new beginning, that rejuvenation. That's what the Tawbah is about. It is never okay to have done anything to harm ourselves and to harm other people, gratuitously. But it is important not to remain in that ditch and to climb out and continue our journey. Shaitan wants to keep us there. And this is why rumination, constantly thinking about the things that went wrong, is one of his tools. So psychologically, we need to free ourselves from that. The second aspect is structured invocation, which is du'as. And they are beautiful as mirrors, because the Ayyam al-Islam give us an array of different aspects of behaviors and thought patterns to prompt us to think, actually, am I doing that? If so, how am I doing that? Du'as are mirrors because they ask us lots of questions about ourselves. In fact, in the Saif al Sajadiyya, Imam Zalamdin alayhi salam, for instance, in Dua'i Tawbah and in other aspects, talks about the process of repentance, knowing that I will, you forgive me, knowing that I will come back and repeat that sin. Not that it's okay that I'm going to come back and do it. It's about recognizing that I'm not strong enough to completely avert it. But I start and I fall. And I start again and I fall. When that little child is learning how to walk. It doesn't just rise from its crib and strive forward into the world. No, that's not how human beings work. It starts and it falls and it stands up again. It walks two steps and it falls. Then it stands and walks three steps and it falls. So we may go for one day without committing that sin and then do it again. We may go for then two days and then do it again. That doesn't mean it's okay when we do it. It's about recognizing the process of growth. That is the compassion. Not the, oh, it's okay, it's fine. And that's where dua can help us. It can give us a set of mirrors to show us what we are doing that we may be oblivious to. We may not know, it may be in our blind spot. Duas can help us highlight things that we are doing that we may not be conscious of. And the third aspect is spontaneous invocation, Nida. And in Surah Maryam, at the beginning, we have those beautiful words uh, relating to Prophet Zakaria, you know, when he was really anxious about that chapter in his life with respect to um, 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 offspring. 
and uh, he calls out to his Lord. In the, we have that verse, إِذْ نَادَ رَبَّهُ نِدَاعًا That he called out, إِذْ نَادَ It was a spontaneous speech from his heart to his Creator. It was the dialogue between the Beloved and the Beloved. إِذْ نَادَ رَبَّهُ To his Lord Cherisher, to his Beloved Lord. نِدَاعًا خَفِيَّ That intimate communication. So he's walking with us. We work through him, with him, to him. That's what grace is. That the grace of Allah Subhanahu wa provides the vehicle of akhlaq, sends us the rahmatul alamin, the Holy Prophet, to guide us that these are the, the, the mechanisms and the tools. And he provides the spiritual fuel, that intention, so that the vehicle may progress towards him. This is a journey with Allah's assistance through the will and the energy he gives us to greater connection with him. This is all about adhkuruni wa adhkurukum. This is all about what the verse was talking about, the Quranic verse was talking about, our relationship to Allah SWT. And this is why we end our discussion with the way we began, with the very clear teaching of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, that the central mission for which he came was akhlaq. Surely I was sent for the perfection of human character, for in that process lies our hope and our ability to be able to achieve and taste tangibly that qurbatan illallah, that, that proximity to Allah SWT. Ahsan, thank you very much for that. Um, I hope the viewers at home enjoyed that as much as I did and gained as much as I did. I want to thank you once again for taking the time out. It was uh, indeed a, a pleasure. Uh, join us again uh, next week where we look specifically now at various different elements to this journey, uh, this greater jihad, this greater struggle, this greater striving. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bait TV, the holy household for every household.